are in his home uh, there in Togo, West Africa. Also, the Lord will now be in Tanzania. Uh, this time, last time I was in Zambia, uh, Nigeria. I don't think I'm going to go back to Nigeria uh, this time, but uh, or Zambia, but I will be in a couple of places there. Then next February, right after my Gulf Coast Men for Christ meeting, I'll be going back to India. I wish you'd pray about sending your preacher. I'm going to be doing about nine or ten uh, leadership conferences. Uh, there will be eight sessions. We'll have uh, two sessions in the morning, two in the afternoon, two at night, and then two again the next morning. And I really would like to have him to help me with that. Uh, we'll be training preachers, uh, doing leadership conferences. I did four of those this last time I was there. I really believe that it's the answer to making a difference in helping those folks. We've started churches. We've started orphanages. We've had the big meetings where we have 15,000. And, you know, anytime you can get somebody saved, you don't want them to take, make that light. But to be able to train the pastors, then they're going to affect the churches. And that's really what we need. Uh, and so I hope, wish you'd pray about that. I really would like for him to be able to go during that time uh, if that is at all possible. <clears throat> I'm going to do something totally different, for me at least, uh, this morning. Usually I take a passage of Scripture and preach through that passage of Scripture. I'm not going to try to do that this morning. I'm going to give you four different scenarios, four different stories, four different passages. We're going to talk about those a little bit, and then we'll come back and draw a conclusion from each of those about what we need. One of the things that bothers me today uh, is that uh, you are getting your information from uh, the Internet. You're getting your information from television. You're getting your information from radio and the newspapers. And as a result of that, uh, then you are making decisions based on what those things are telling you. And what they tell you is totally different than what the Word of God says. Uh, th there is not a uh, money crisis in America. Uh, I've looked this crowd over this morning. There's nobody here prayed for daily bread. Uh, we are the only nation on the face of the earth that people diet. Every other nation, they're trying to get a handful of rice. Keep that. There are two things unique to America. One of them is Americans diet. Number two is we rent uh, uh, storage units to put the stuff that we hadn't seen in 10 years. <clears throat> that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. You can't find another nation where the people diet nor can you find another nation where they have rental units that they can put their extra stuff in, okay? Because they don't have any stuff. Uh, we're, we're accepting our philosophy from the world. And then you've got our preachers that are on television in the various places, and they tell us that if you're in the will of God, doing what God told you to do, then you will have no financial problems, you will have no health problems, uh, that everything is going to be great because you're in the will of God, doing what God said for you to do. I've often wondered how those people even die. Yeah. You know, really. I mean, you know, because, I mean, there's a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel being preached in America. And you're hearing it. Now, now you may not embrace it. You may not go to the churches where it's taught. But you hear it constantly. And so you get the idea if things are wrong in your life, if things are not going too good, then there must be something terrible going on. I mean, you might, in fact, you judge each other, do you not? Uh, I told Pat years ago, I said, well, to get some buttons printed up, six-inch buttons that say spiritual inspector. Because I said, we got a lot of people in these churches that look at everybody else and inspect them to see why they're having the problem they're having. Now, if you're having a problem, it's because God's trying you. But if they're having a problem, it's sin in their life, right? Yeah, I understand. I know exactly. And, and isn't, that, isn't that the philosophy? I mean, isn't that where we go? So we're going to look at something a little different this morning. Uh, I'm going to give you the story rather than read a lot of verses this morning, but in Exodus chapter 5, if you'd like to turn there, I will read some verses from there in just a moment. Uh, the children of Israel are in Egyptian bondage. They've been there for about 70 years. Uh, God has sent Moses and Aaron to deliver them. And uh, when Moses comes on the scene in verse 1 of chapter 5 and goes in to talk to Pharaoh to tell him that God wants him to let his people go, and then Pharaoh says a remarkable thing. He said, I don't know God. I don't know anything about your God. I don't respect him, and I'm not doing anything that he said. Now, before this story is over, Pharaoh will get to know God. He will certainly know a great deal about him. After he gets through with the ten plagues, Pharaoh will know who God is. He does not know him in the free part of sin.
sin. <clears throat> but if Moses, you know the story. Go back here, and as this happens, then things don't get better. Go down to verse 20 with me just for a moment. And they met Moses and Aaron. This is talking about the uh, Israelites who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you, because ye have made our Savior to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh. And the eyes of his and us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast so evil entreated thy people? Why that thou hast sent me? For since I can name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Pharaoh finally the reason you're let people go is because you don't and so not a bricks you've been making but you're going to have to get your own straw and so things did not get better for the children of Israel things got worse so Moses and the will of God somebody ought to say amen doing exactly what God told him to do where God told him to be come on and not not only is it not better it's getting worse I mean, is that is that a correct analysis of what we're looking at? The book of seventeen to the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, be due to reign these years, but according to my word, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that's for Jordan. Shall be that thou shalt drink. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook earth that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, and drank of the brook. Notice verse. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Now, can I go ahead and tell you that that's what's wrong with Christianity after a while? Don't nearly know when they. I mean, they're all in heaven. Our brother was telling me today's his second year anniversary from the time that he got saved, and it's exciting time. And it's great to know you're not going to die and go to hell. It's great to know that God's prepared a place for you. It's great to know that He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But the problem is, you get up the next morning after you get saved, and you're still married to the same person. You still work for the have the same children you had. Come on. You had smoking before you got saved. Good chance you want a cigarette. If you had a filthy mouth, you're not carrying the same words as you get saved, you did before you get saved. Can I, can I tell you what happens? Life is what happens. And life is difficult to deal with. Bible says it can't pass after a while the brook dried up. Now let me ask you a question. Is Elijah where God sent him? Is Elijah in the will of God? Is Elijah doing what God said for him to do? Come on. And the brook dried up. Uh, now before that the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. Now maybe you think that, that's exciting. Are you aware that a raven is cousin to a buzzard? They're scavengers. Now maybe you'd be excited about a buzzard bringing you your breakfast. Or maybe you think a buzzard brings you your breakfast. I don't know. But, you know, very seldom does God do things like we plan it. Here's Elijah in the will of God doing exactly what God said for him to do, where God said for him to do it, the brook dried up. Do you know why the brook dried up? Nobody knows. It tells us in the verse. Why did the brook dry up? Because it hadn't rained. Why it hadn't rained? Because Elijah prayed. You talk about a guy that was a product of his own prayer life, that's where Elijah was, wasn't he? Now, wait a minute. It doesn't get better. God said, Elijah, I want you to go down to Zarephath that belongeth to Zidon. I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, now Zarephath that belongeth to Zidon. Now, Elijah's got a problem with Ahab and Jezebel. But the king of the Zidonians was Jezebel's daddy. It's almost like God said, you think you're having trouble with her? I'm going to send you down to the one that trained her. You talk about getting out of the proverbial fry into the fire. And don't kid yourself, Elijah knew that. You go down there, the woman down there, widow 
woman, and I've commanded her to tarry. Now, you are, but I have a pretty good imagination. It me there was some widow woman that was going to take care of me. I would think of some old gal, if she's out picking up, she'd have rings on every finger, mink coat. Come on, help me. I tell you, she wouldn't be in worse shape than she was. But that's what he found. He found a widow woman that didn't have anything. And not only that, she had a bad attitude. Yeah. Ask her for something to eat. She, she said, you, me and my son are about to eat this. And this for us. She's probably an independent Baptist, amen. She said, we're through. I mean, this is, it, it's, it, we're out of here. I mean, we're going to eat this last meal. And then that's it. Come on. And him being a man of God, God said, let's go make me some first. <laughs> wow. But you know what he was trying to get her to understand? He was trying to get her to understand that she needed to put God first. Now, I'm not going to go on with this because we'll, we'll come back to it in just a little bit. Let me give you another story, okay? Uh, we got Moses in the will of God doing what God said to do, and it's not working. Matter of fact, it's getting worse. Come on. We got Elijah in the will of God doing what God said for him to do, and the brook dries up. Now, maybe you've never been in the will of God doing what God said for you to do, and your brook dried up. But if you haven't, it's because you're young. If you'll keep living, it'll happen. And you won't know what to do. Amen. But it does happen, doesn't it? Uh, let me give you a third one, okay? Over in the New Testament, Acts chapter, I believe it's chapter 27. I'm not going to turn there. I'm going to tell you the story, okay? There's a guy by the name of Apostle Paul. You remember him? And uh, he's been taken prisoner. And he appealed to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen. So he appeals to Caesar. And so they're going to have to take him to Rome so that he can appear before, to see, before Caesar. But uh, they've hung around too long. And uh, the time of the feast has passed. And so the weather's changing. And so Paul says, you know, we really don't need to leave. This is a bad time for us to be sailing. We don't need to leave now. But they listened to the other group. And the Bible says, and the south wind blew softly. And supposing, by the way, you better be careful when south wind blows softly. And uh, they, they looked at circumstances and they said it'll be okay. And so they had headed out. They hadn't gone very far until there was a great storm. A storm that was so large that God named it. He called it Eurocladon. And this storm came on the scene. And for 14 days and 14 nights they did not see the sun, the moon, or the stars. Let me tell you what that means. They were lost. The way they navigated in those days was by the sun, the moon, and the stars. When they hadn't seen the sun, moon, and the stars, they didn't know where they were. And so they had thrown the tackling of the ship overboard. They had thrown the food overboard. I mean, these people, according to Scripture, all hope that we should be saved was then given up. These people had come to the end of the rope, and they believed that death was imminent for them. About that time, while Paul's asleep, the angel of the Lord shows up and wakes him up and says, Paul, everything's going to be okay. You've got to get to Rome. You've got to get to Caesar. And I'm going to give you everybody on the ship. Nobody's going to die. Everything's going to be fine. So Paul, being a Baptist preacher, <laughs> then the next morning when he got up, he just got everybody together and said, hey, I got some good news. Uh, everything's going to be okay. The angel of the Lord, whom I belong to, uh, he spoke to me last night and said, everything's going to be all right. Nobody's going to die. We're going to be fine. So we need to go ahead and eat. We hadn't eaten in days. We need to go ahead and eat. Everything's going to be all right. So they ate. You know what happened next? Ship fell apart. Read it. That's what happened. Ship fell apart. They floated in on boards. I mean, Paul just stood up and gave a rousing message about how God's going to take care of everything. Everything's going to be all right. And the ship falls apart. And if that wasn't bad enough, when they got to the bank, they built a big fire trying to dry out, and he's picking up some sticks and drops them in, and a snake comes out and bites him. Now, long about then, I'd have been having a pity party. I'd have been saying, God, here I am doing what you said for me to do. I'm where you told me to go, and nothing's working. Come on. Matter of fact, it's getting worse. Matter of fact, I got snake bit. I mean, I'm a tr I mean, this thing's bad. Come on. That's where he was. You're not acting very impressed, okay? Let's, let, let's look at another. Let, let, let's look at one more, okay? Uh, you'd have to go back, I, I believe, to uh, Samuel uh, is, where, is where this story is found. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, and it's about a man by the name of David. You remember him? King of Israel. Uh, but this is prior to him sitting on the throne. Uh, he has 600 mighty men. These are men that have come out of debt and depression and despair, and they're following David. They believe that he is the anointed 
king of Israel. And so they're excited. In fact, uh, these are his mighty men. These are the ones that three of them fought their way across the valley, got water, brought it back. You remember the story? Uh, they, these are the guys where one of them stood in that pea patch and fought so long that his hand claved to the sword he couldn't even turn it loose. Uh, I mean, these are David's mighty men. They have a city called Ziglag. It's not a city like Circe. It's a, it's a tent city. They're nomadic people. Uh, but all of their sheep are there. All of their cattle are there. Everything, all their ca- everything is there. That's where their wealth is. That's where their wives are, their children are. The men are off at war, but all the wives and children and all their stock and everything's here in the city of Ziglag. And while they're gone, the enemy comes and burns the city. Steals the wives, steals the children, steals all of their wealth, takes everything of value away from them. Now, I don't know how long David and his men were gone. I don't know whether when they got back the smoke was still rising from the burning of the city, or I don't know when they got there, and then everything was kind of caked over and it rained on it and everything was just left. I don't know. But I know when they got back and they came close to the city, there were no dogs barking, running out to meet their masters. There were no little boys running out, grabbing hold of their daddy's leg, waiting on him to pick them up and put them on their shoulder as they walked in. There were no little girls running out to hug their daddy. There were no wives standing in the doorway of their tent waiting to give their husband a little sugar and welcome him home. There was no lowing of the cattle. There was no blading of the sheep. Everything was dead. Everything of value was taken away. They had nothing. Their wives were gone. Their children was gone. Their wealth was gone. All they had was burned tents. And the Bible says the people spake of stoning David. Now, preacher, it's bad enough when the abortion crowd and the liquor crowd and the dope crowd are against you. But when these people turn against you, it's real bad. And that's where David was. The people spake of stoning David. Pretty tough place, wasn't it? Let me ask you a question. Is David God's man? Has David been anointed? Is David in the will of God? So why is all it? I mean, I mean, we've read four stories of people in the will of God and everything's bad. Come on. So where's all this health, wealth, and prosperity stuff? I mean, where's all these messages from these guys down in Texas that are telling us that everything's going to be okay? I mean, is this the Bible? Well, sure it is. Let's see if we can learn something, okay? Moses, man of God, in the will of God, doing exact. Now, this is not going to be profound. This is going to be very simple. But if you do this, you're going to miss what you need for the future. Are you listening? What did Moses do? Moses went to God. I said Moses went to God. I said Moses went to God. You know, you better learn to go to God. I'm sorry, but in the days to come, you better learn to go to God. I do not find, I've been reading this book for a long time. I've been seriously trying to serve God for 40-something years. Can I tell you something? I don't find the United States of America in the end time. Now, if you do, God bless you. Come show me. I'll look at it, okay? But I don't, I don't find the United States of America in the end time. If that's true, then either the United States of America has become so weak that it's not a world power any longer. Or it's not in existence. And either one of those are scary for me. Because I'm, I'm a patriot. I'm a United States citizen. I love it. I mean, I love this nation. I mean, I'm proud of it. I hate the things we've done wrong, but I'm glad for the things that we've tried to do right. Amen. But I don't see it. Now, what what, what are we going to... Well, you better learn to go to God. Inter- <clears throat> interesting about those folks in... Uh, about those folks in India. Did you know when they can't pay their bills, did you know they don't have a credit card? Did you know when they have trouble financially getting a handful of rice to feed their children, you know they can't go to the bank, that, that, they don't go to the bank and borrow money. You know what those Christians do? They pray. I know this is an innovative idea. I said they pray. You know, when they, when, they can't, when, when they can't feed their family, you know what they do? They pray. Did you know they don't have money to go to a doctor so when a child's sick, do you know what they do? They pray. You and I would better learn to go to God. Did you hear me? Elijah, in the will of God, doing exactly 
what God put him there to do and nothing's working I mean it, it's just not I mean the brook deal didn't work out doesn't look like the widow woman's going to work out but you know what he did read your Bible he listened to God's word do you know why we're in the mess we're in because we have ignored this book we would not be we would not be patriotizing the, the homosexuals and advocating that that's an alternate lifestyle if we believed that book we wouldn't do that we would not accept the immorality that we accept we've come to a place where life in America is very very cheap you don't take a gun and shoot 26 people and really think that life by the way I dare you to go back I dare you to go back and study the last several times go to Columbine go to every one of them and you know what you're going to find out you're going to find out that every one of those people that shot people were on a drug that was given to them by a doctor recommended from some school pay attention to me they're on an antidepressant drug now, I'm not advocating there are not some people that need some help with things like that, but I'm telling you something, friend. We are, and, and, and here's how crazy we are. <clears throat> Did you know this guy that killed the people up in Connecticut? Do you know where he got the guns? He stole them. Do you know he killed his mama? Come on. Okay, did you know that he violated law when he went to the school with the guns? He violated law when he stole the guns. He violated the law when he killed his mama. He violated the law when he went to the school with the guns. He violated the law when he started shooting people. So what are we going to do to remedy it? Pass another law. Do you understand if these people don't obey the law, passing another law is not going to change anything? I'll tell you what would have changed it if it had some guy sitting there at the reception center with a gun and that old boy walked up and pulled them guns. He'd have shot him. I had eliminated that. By the way, Mr. Obama's children go to a school where they have somebody that sits in front with a gun. Our, your children don't deserve the same thing. Well, we got a problem. I said, we got a problem. But as long as we ignore that book, we've kicked prayer out of the school. We've kicked Bible reading out of the school. That would have never happened if we hadn't already kicked it out of our homes. If we were practicing that in our homes, we wouldn't have allowed it to happen. And I'm very, man, that was such a tragedy in Connecticut. I would never, I mean, it's unbelievable that that guy killed 26 people. But when our president stood with a tear in his eye and talked about how those 20 children would never have a graduation day and never have a wedding day, I couldn't help but think, and, and, and I, I'm glad that it moved him. But as you know, that same day in America, we killed till 2,000 more children with government-backed money. We called it abortion, but we still killed them. And they'll never have a graduation day. And they'll never have a marriage day. Who's weeping over them? Do you understand, friend? We've got a problem because we've ignored that book. We had better learn to listen to God. Our homes are not going to get better until we listen to God. Our schools are not going to get better. Our churches are not going to be what they're supposed to be till we listen to God. Now you believe whatever you want to, but the problem in America is not a money problem. It's a heart problem. If you believe it's a money problem, try to go out to eat on Friday night or Saturday night. And if you go to a good place, you'll wait 20 to 45 minutes. Come on. Our problem's not money. There's enough money to evangelize the world. There's enough, there's enough people to evangelize the world. You know what the Filipinos are doing? Boy, I love it. Filipinos are sending people all over the world. Now, India's not yet, and they ought to, because they got the people. But the Filipinos are sending... Those Filipinos are... I don't know what color they are. They're, they're kind of like, they're, they're like you. They're not really white, and they're not really black. Do you know where they can go? Everywhere. They're accepted everywhere. You can go to Africa, they'll accept you. You can go to the Philippines, they'll accept you. You know what they'll do? They look at me, white face. Come on, I'm not kidding. But those Filipino people, they can go anywhere. They can go to Thailand, and they're going to Thailand. And they're reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Boy, what a blessing to see some folks that have taken the gospel and are doing something with it. By the way, did you know, and I'm going to Africa, the Lord willing, in August. This will be my third trip over there. But can I tell you something? The gospel was in Africa long before the United States of America was in existence. Yes, it was. Four, five hundred years. Read, read history. You'll figure it out. Somewhere we've got to take, we've got to listen to the Word of God. Okay, let, let me hurry, all right? Uh, number one, we've got to go to God. Number two, we've got to listen to the Word of God. Number three, it's real simple, the Apostle Paul. What did he do? Well, he just kept doing what he knew to do. This is real deep, isn't it? I said he kept doing what he knew to do. Did you know I could tell you how for Liberty Baptist Church to have revival? You wouldn't even have to have a meeting. You wouldn't have to pay me to come and preach. You could just have revival. I can tell you how, okay? Here's how you have revival. All of you people that promised God you were going to do better, all of you that said you were going to read your Bible more, all of you that sometime last year said you were going to be more faithful to church and you were going to start helping a missionary somewhere. And all of you that said, you know, I really hadn't been doing too good. I've been watching junk I shouldn't watch and listening to junk I shouldn't listen to. And I, I'm going to do better about that. And all of you that said, you know, I'm going to start telling people about Jesus, handing out some of them little papers and little tracts, and I, I'm going to do better about that. If all of you would do what you said you would do, you could have revival. You really could. You wouldn't have to have another sermon. You wouldn't have to have another altar call. You'd just be honest and do what you told God you'd do. You did tell him, didn't you? Sure you did. Might have been while you was driving down the road listening to country, some Christian music. I almost said country music. <laughs> That'll inspire you to go get drunk, won't it? But anyway, you're driving down the road listening to some Christian music. Might have been when the preacher preached and you came to an altar. Might have been in the privacy of your own home. I don't know when it happened. But it happened, didn't it? Didn't you tell God? Sure you did. So why don't you do what you... Well, preacher, I just don't know the will of God for my life. I love that one. Yeah. Preacher, I just don't know the will of God. Really? You don't know the will of God? Well, let me help you, okay? Did you know the Bible says... We'll just have to go to the Bible, okay? The Bible says it's the will of God that you sin not. You missed it. I said it is the will of God that you sin not. How are you doing on that one? That'll keep you busy for a while, won't it? Not sinning? Won't that keep you busy for a while? Uh, would you like another one? Romans chapter, what is chapter 8? It said is the will of, well, it doesn't just say the will of God. It says the predestinate, we Baptists really like that, predestinate will of God that you be conformed to the image of Christ. Wow. How are you doing with that one? Your temper, is it like Jesus? Come on. Your anger, is it like Jesus? Come on. Your lust, is that like Jesus? Your greed, is that like Jesus? Your self-centeredness, is that like Jesus? No, no. It, I, I, I promise you, you'll stay busy not sinning and trying to be like Jesus. Now, I, that doesn't mean that I, that I know whether you're supposed to be an airplane mechanic or whether you're supposed to be a doctor. or I don't know what you're supposed to be. But see, here's what you want. You want a spotlight. You want to be able to shine down the road, see what's down the road five miles. That's not the way it works. His word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. As you take the steps, as you sin not, as you be conformed to the image of Christ, as you walk along. I, I never did understand. My grandma, when I was a kid growing up, all the cows had to be milked in the dark. I didn't understand why you couldn't milk cows in the daytime. But we'd get up before daylight, go down to the barn, milk the cows, come in after supper, after work, after dark, go milk the cows in the dark. There was a great big pile of rocks out there by the path down to the barn. And that pile of rocks had copperheads in it. I knew I'd shot some of them with a BB gun. Usually it'd just make them mad with a BB gun. But man, we'd take, Grandma would take that lantern and we'd start down through. Jimmy, stay close to me. Stay close to me. Don't, now, now stay close to me. Don't get over there close to the rocks. Come on, help me here. Now as long as I stayed in the light, I was okay. But I couldn't see the barn. Now I knew it was down there. I'd been down there before. But I couldn't see it. You know what your problem is? You want to look too far. Why don't you do what God told you to do today? Let's see. Do you know you're supposed to read your Bible? Well, amen. We got three. I said, do you know you're supposed to read your Bible? You know you're supposed to pray? 
You know you're supposed to be kind one to another? Oh, boy, that's a tough one, isn't it? Do you understand you're supposed to witness to people, tell people about Christ? Come on. Why don't you do what you know to do? That's what Paul did. Paul just kept doing what he knew to do. By the way, let me back up just a minute before I give you the last one, okay? You will remember that Moses did lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. You do remember that Elijah did go ahead eating. Come on. And you do remember that Paul did arrive at Rome. Matter of fact, started a church there, didn't he? Come on. So all this falling apart stuff, all this not working stuff, it actually did work out, didn't it? Just didn't happen as soon as we'd like for it to. It didn't happen on our plan. Let's go to David. The Bible says that they spake of stoning him. And then it makes an interesting statement. It said, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, I tried to find that, preacher. I mean, I went through that whole chapter to try to find out what David did. Matter of fact, I went to the chapter after that and the chapter before that, and I couldn't find nothing that told me what David did to encourage himself in the Lord. That's another sermon I won't try to preach this morning, but I had to go back to 1 Samuel 17 to find it. And David is going up toward Goliath. He has just showed up on the scene, and everybody's saying, Hey! Have you seen Goliath? And David said, No. Have you all seen God? Forty mornings and forty nights, they've been looking at Goliath. All that time they was looking at Goliath, David's on the back side of the desert taking care of the sheep, but he's looking at God. Come on. Come help me, brother. We'll do this real quick, okay? <clears throat> Let's suppose that this brother is a problem. Did I get the right guy? Let's suppose he's a problem. Now let's suppose I'm God. If you put the problem in front of God, you don't see much of God. My case, a little bit hangs out on both sides. That's about the extent. Of it. But if you move the problem and try to see the problem through God, you don't see much of the problem. Now, the problem has not changed sizes. God's not changed sizes. The only question is what you're looking at. Now, you can try to see God through the problem, and you won't see much of God. Or you can try to see the problem through God and you won't see much of the problem. Now, you don't have a choice whether you get a problem or not. Well, some of you did. Years ago, it was too late. You already married them. Amen. Thank you, brother. But you do have a choice about how you look at the problem, don't you? Do you know what David did? David looked at God. The rest of them looked at Goliath. Come on. So that day when they talked about stoning him, here's what I think happened. Now, this is my opinion. This is not Bible. Okay, this is Brownology. Okay, I think he walked over where his tent was burned. I think he kicked something. And it rolled out. His great big thing looked like a pumpkin. He reached down, picked it up, held it a minute, I believe just at the corner of his mouth, a little bit of a smile, not much. He tossed it down, reached back and picked something up, lifted up above his head, almost looked like a table. Held that thing up above his head for just a little while and stepped back, let it hit the ground. See, he's just picked up Goliath's helmet and Goliath's shield. I know he did because the Bible says that he took it and put it in his tent. Come on. And here's what I think he thought. Pretty rough day that day too. Things didn't look too promising that day either. You, you do remember that day? Ten foot giant and David's facing him. And Saul tries to give him his weapons. By the way, let me just tell you this. You need to be afraid of somebody who tells you how to deal with life who has not dealt with life very well. Are you listening? Dumbest thing that I've ever seen is people in church uh, start having family problems. They go talk to divorced people. Could I tell you something? If a guy's got 12 broke down vehicles in his front yard, don't get him to work on yours. He don't know what he's doing. Do you understand? Saul says, here, take my armor. And David said, oh, I can't take that. He said, I hadn't proved that. I got this sling, and I killed a bear with it, and I killed a lion with it. Girls, pay attention. And I have thrown this thing a thousand times at rocks and trees and everything of the sun, I think I'll just take it. 
And the Bible says he went down to the brook and he took five smooth stones. Now, I've heard Baptist preachers explain that about how many brothers he had. Let me tell you why he took five smooth stones. Because that's all that would fit in his pouch. If he could have put any more in there, he would have put some more in there. But that's all he could take, so that's all he took. And he went out to face Goliath. Okay, come up here, Goliath. Now, the Bible says that he threw that rock and it hit Goliath in the forehead right there. Now, let me explain. If you hit it in the forehead, he's going back. You see that? But the Bible says that Goliath fell on his face. That's because God slapped him back of the head. This rock hit him here. God hit him here, and there he went. Thank you, brother. You did good. Well, you figure it out. Come on. David didn't kill Goliath. God killed Goliath. Sure he did. So, here's David. They're talking about stoning him. And old David gets to remember. Come on. This wasn't his first time to remember. You remember when he's facing Goliath? And, and they said, how in the world can you do this? You're just a boy. And he said, well, I killed a lion. And God let me kill a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, he'll be just like one of them. So when David got ready to face the problems, you know what he did? He remembered the victory. Now, I may be looking at people this morning that are going through financial reversals, marital problems. You may have cancer growing in your body. I don't know. But I need to ask you a question. Has God ever done anything in your life? Has He? Has there ever been a time when God answered your prayer? Were you ever close to God? Did God ever bail you out? Then why don't you remember how good God's been? Instead of looking at the problems and the heartache and the difficulties now, why don't you remember the goodness of God? Now, I don't have time to finish this because, boy, there's a lot David did. But, but let's just go back and, and rehash it and we'll be through, okay? Moses went to God. Elijah listened to God's word. Paul did what he knew to do. And David remembered the goodness of God. What, what do you think, church? Shouldn't that be what we do? Maybe your boats fall apart. I don't know. Maybe you floated in on the boards. Maybe everybody's against you. I don't know. Maybe you've prayed, tried to be in the will of God, and your brook dried up. I don't know. Maybe the people that you love the most and that you thought were behind you are talking about stoning you. But has God ever been good to you? Has he? Do you think you could remember how good God is? The goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. Now, I don't know where you are. And it may be, you may just need to file this sermon away for later. <laughs> you may not even need it right now. But I promise you, if you keep living, you will need it. Some of you may be in the middle of a storm right now. And you need God. Could I tell you, He's very close. One of my favorite verses about Apostle Peter, you remember? And he stepped out of the boat, and then he started sinking. And it says that Jesus reached out and immediately, did you hear me? Immediately. I said immediately. I like God's timing, don't you? I really do. I don't know where Jesus was. I don't know where Peter was. I mean, Peter wasn't with him yet. But when he started to sink, Jesus reached out and immediately took care of it, didn't he? I tell you, God will take care of things. Our nation is scary. What's going to happen with our economy? It's scary. I don't know what's going to happen with my own health. Sometimes it's scary. I tell you, God's in charge. I said, God's in charge. What am I going to do? Okay. I'm going to keep on trying to keep everybody I can out of hell. I'm going to keep on trying to encourage Christians to live for God. I'm going to keep on going as far as I can go to reach people that need to be saved. I'm going to pray for my nation. I'm going to pray for my president. Every time I get a chance to vote, I'm going to vote. Because I'm So if I'm going to gripe, I'm going to vote. And you folks that don't vote, you keep your mouth shut. You don't have anything to say. So I'm going to do everything I can to change everything I can. But you know what I know? I know 
that before the Lord comes, they don't think some things get pretty bad. So maybe that's where we are. And maybe there's nothing we can do about it. And I'm still going to try. But I'm not going to give up on God. God, He's not going to give up. We're out of time. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Sure, thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you for the Word of God, the clarity of it, the understandableness of it. Lord, thank you that nobody has to be confused about it. Lord, we can understand what you said, and we can draw strength from your Word and from these passages of Scripture. Help us, Lord, to go to you. Help us to listen to you. Help us to do what we know to do, and help us to remember the goodness of God. Father, somebody here today that desperately needs your help. Somebody's going through a burden and a trial and a difficulty that maybe nobody else knows about. I don't know. Lord, you do. And I pray this morning you'd make it very clear how much you love them. Make it very clear that you want to help them and strengthen them. Meet whatever needs they have in their life today. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed.